Um, before we get started, um, I think everyone knows uh, uh, today's speaker, so I don't need to give a prolonged introduction. Um, but uh, uh, we're glad to have uh, Stephen Wilkes with us today to uh, present his paper. And I will not take up any more of the time. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <coughs> Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for giving me the chance to talk about the work. Um, my research trajectory reflects a broad interest in governance and regulation with a particular interest in payment systems and payment systems architecture. I understand payment systems to mean a set of actors, instruments, processes uh, that are used to support the transfer of monetary value. Thanks to technological innovation, these systems have evolved to include debit cards, credit cards, electronic funds transfers, internet banking, and so on. This arena is an important locus of activity where participants give effect to the full range of their social, political, economic, and cultural aspirations. And therefore, how we pay for things uh, matters as much as uh, what we buy with our choice of payment instruments. Today, I'm going to be discussing the final installment in uh, three writings that explore these ideas from a law and society perspective. The full arc of this work considers how public and private law combine to mediate relationships between uh, payment system participants with a particular focus on the effect on marginalized populations. The first of these uh, pieces looked at America's food stamp program which I argued devoted more uh, energy and resources to delivery mechanisms than to taking care of the end users. The second explored the politicization of migrant remittance flows as part of a broader intentional strategy to intentionally exploit white working class um, identity politics during the 2016 presidential campaign. Uh, the third and most recent project examines two phenomena uh, contributing to cardholder stratification uh, in credit card markets and predicts that they will produce racially problematic outcomes to the degree that inequality, income inequality generally correlates with race. Uh, before turning to today's discussion, I thought it would be helpful to look to the diagram on my right and just generally walk folks through how our credit card landscape works. So most of us will apply online uh, for a credit card which uh, is issued to us. Uh, once we activate the card, uh, we um, take it to our merchant. Let's say, for example, we spend $100 uh, to purchase something. Uh, and uh, we then swipe the card. Uh, at a uh, point of sale, and that triggers a series of information relays between the financial institutions representing uh, the consumer's credit card and the merchant. This information relay facilitates an extension of credit on behalf of the consumer, which the consumer is responsible for, and uh, the funds are therefore transferred to the acquirer uh, institution which represents the merchant less a uh, fee uh, and a portion of that fee is known as an interchange fee. This interchange fee represents in theory uh, uh, the cost of processing that payment and that turns to the first, uh, first of the two arguments that I'm exploring in my latest piece, which is titled Private Interests, Public Law, and a Reconfigured Inequality in the Modern Credit Card Industry. This piece will appear as a lead article in the spring 2019 volume of the Dickinson Law Review. And I argue in this piece that two industry developments will, will support cardholder hierarchies uh, to the particular detriment of subsistence borrowers, whose ranks disproportionately represent uh, people of color. The first involves uh, this notion that um, there's a balance here between these two sides of the market, the blue and the uh, red, which are sort of the acquirer and issuer side of the market, 
um, and that there are sort of interesting First Amendment challenges uh, to uh, the public law regulations that control the, um, the fee structures that are at the heart of this, this interchange fee system. I surmise that if uh, merchants are free to impose additional surcharges um, as, a, as a result of successful First Amendment challenges, that merchants will be free to really engage in some very interesting problems, disruptive problems within this payment market. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. The second half of the uh, paper looks at what I call algorithmic lending practices, which use technology to extend uh, structural racism's cumulative effects into the underwriting process. I argue that uh, such processes complicate the effects of structural racism by marrying them with tradi marrying traditional metrics like your zip code, uh, your credit rating, and your social security number with other forms of data mining that draw from behavioral data banks we all contribute to when we use these cards. And this produce, produces another kind of hierarchy uh, albeit in ways that make it difficult to isolate implicit bias from legitimate uh, business practices around uh, determining someone's credit worthiness. So let's look at the first issue, which focuses on these surcharges that I was talking about earlier in the presentation. So credit cards, credit card networks, like the one that I depict here, typically operate in what we call two-sided markets. That is, uh, one side of the market subsidizes the other. Uh, and in a lot of uh, literature in this space, what you find is a rationale which says, look, you have this credit card market, uh, this card network. Uh, the one side is better equipped to handle these system operating costs than the other, and therefore they should absorb most of those costs, which is one of the reasons why most of us don't normally pay a huge amount for the credit card fees and so on. The processing costs associated with capturing and processing uh, credit card payments are usually borne by the merchants. This is rooted in the theory of network effects, and Stephen Samararo puts it this way. He says, in two-sided markets, an efficient pricing structure must discriminate between two customer groups based upon the cost of serving each group and their relative demand elasticity. Because merchant demand for credit cards is less elastic than consumer demand, an efficient pricing structure will place greater cost burden on merchants. If surcharging were permitted, merchants could shift that cost to cardholders Rewarding the system's ability to price discriminate and thereby reducing credit card volume below efficient levels. What he's saying in so many words is that if we tinker with the existing model of cost sharing, that we effectively discourage credit card use generally and that depopulates the network such that it ceases to uh, operate effectively. Modern day equivalent. Um, Internet dating sites, heterosexual dating sites are often free for women uh, while they will charge men a fee. Um, similarly with nightclubs, they will sort of admit women for free before a certain hour while they've already gone to bed. And the, sort of the males are free, are, are going to have to pay a certain, pay a certain uh, cost of admission. So uh, that's how two-sided markets work. This is a controversial idea, uh, and there's a lot of debate about this. Adam Levitin argues, for example, that such price allocation uh, forces retailers in the credit card context to accept high-priced reward and corporate cards that produce no incremental benefit to the merchants, and they distort the <coughs> systems market by shielding consumers from the cost created by their payment method. The problem with this debate on both sides is that we don't have a concrete way of being clear about what the actual payment processing costs are relative to what is being what the merchants are paying to process payments. In other words, we don't know what the markup is. We don't know how much money, how much, what portion of these cards is 
going to offset operating costs, what portion of the cards would be the processing costs are going to offset rewards programs uh, that have to be financed, and what is simply attributable to profit. Right? And I remember having this discussion with colleagues back uh, in 2005 when uh, merchants law uh, launched this sort of major class action suit against credit card companies saying, look, you know, you're engaged in price fixing, you are conspiring to inflate, artificially inflate these, pro these processing costs. And it's interesting that 13 years later, September of this past year, we see this question still sitting out there unresolved. And my working theory is that the merchant, sorry, the credit card companies will almost always settle these claims rather than allow them to go to trial because they don't want uh, all that information out there as to how those costs are being borne and allocated and broken down. Anyhow, moving on, uh, 10 states currently uh, uh, ban uh, merchants from, that prevent merchants from imposing these surcharges. And they'll say, look, you want to, you know, the merchants are saying, look, we find this crazy. It's just too expensive to process these payments. The merchants say, listen, we want to pass on some of these costs in keeping with, you know, similar hours theory. Uh, the industry says, no, you're not allowed to. And what they have done is they have successfully lobbied states uh, to uh, establish these surcharge bans which essentially prohibit merchants from passing on these payment processing costs directly to consumers whenever they supply uh, credit cards as a form of payment. Four states uh, in the last few years have been the subject of First Amendment challenges to these surcharge bans. The challenges argue that surcharge bans violate free speech protections because they prevent merchants from communicating a higher price to consumers who choose to use credit cards. If these challenges succeed, merchants, merchants will be free to uh, resume these surcharging practices. And I actually think that we have a new set of questions to think about. Um, will people reduce their credit card usage, as the theorists predict? Uh, will there be any consistency in the surcharge pricing within and across different sizes of retailers? Right? And I want to add to these questions with this paper by thinking about the position of subsistence borrowers in all of this. Uh, will merchants seize this chance to be opportunistic in their pricing behavior, their surcharging behavior, such that you know maybe this isn't really about the burden of the processing cost, and maybe they're going to start surcharging just because they can in view of the fact that there is no longer a public law constraint on doing that. So are there going to be large or small variances in these surcharge fees? Will there be geographic trends uh, such that certain types of retailers in certain markets are more likely to impose fees? Uh, and and I, so I think there's a lot of disruption coming if those First Amendment claims uh, succeed. I worry about the standing of subsistence borrowers in that concept, in that context, uh, who are economically vulnerable and who are more likely to pay these opportunistic fees in times of economic distress. With that in mind, I think we should go back to the 70s. Starting in 74, we had federal amendments to the Truth in Lending Act which regulated this practice, right? Uh, and it obligated banks to allow merchant discounting. Uh, and uh, there were some disclosure requirements. It was a 5% cap. In 76, TILA was amended again with uh, the operation of discounts remaining. Uh, Congress, however, did ban uh, surcharges. Uh, Congress renewed these bans uh, twice before allowing them to expire in 84. This then gave way to a series of state level. Um, uh, statutes being passed, likely the result of lobbying. And so it, what you see when you look at the, the statutory landscape nowadays is that all of these statutes are similar only in the sense that they ban surcharges, but they are otherwise all over the map with respect to discounts. So some permit discounts, some <coughs> ban uh, dual pricing altogether, some sort of cap 
the permissive discounts at a certain level, uh, and so on. And then there are other jurisdictions where there are industry-specific uh, loopholes. So, for example, there are certain states where you can you you're allowed to dual price in at gas stations. So, a number of you may have seen, depending on where you travel to, that if you pay for cash, buy your gas with cash, you get a discount. If you pay uh, with a card, you you have a separate pricing uh, structure. And so, there are sort of loopholes and carve-outs uh, permitted in a number of different jurisdictions. So, um, if my prediction is correct, I think surcharges are going to be more effective as a pricing deterrent for affluent cardholders than they will be for uh, subsistence borrowers who may be in roughly the same position uh, as those folks who go to payday lenders, right? Uh, if you're going to those kinds of services for your financial needs, you're doing so because uh, you have fewer options and you're more likely to then take on the more problematic fee structures because you've got to meet your basic needs and there are fewer alternatives. Um, what's the solution? Maybe the solution is to let uh, the marketplace sort of work through this disruption for a time being and see, uh, maybe we can see what kinds of behaviors emerge from all of this, and then revisit whether or not there is a regulatory, whether or not a regulatory response is required. Uh, but in the meantime, I think we have to wait and see where the jurisprudence goes, and uh, let this First Amendment conversation uh, sort of uh, work its way through the courts. Uh, we have arguments from the Second, Fifth, Ninth, and Eleventh Circuits. Uh, all these circuit courts have disagreed on this threshold question of whether these regulations regulate behavior rather than speech. Then we have their expressions, which comes out and it settles the question as to, uh, uh, on this issue, and says, no, this regulates speech, but doesn't go as far as addressing the, the substance of First Amendment claim. So that then gets remanded back to the Second Amendment, uh, so to the Second Circuit. And we are now waiting to see what happens next. So this is still very much a work in progress. Um, as I said earlier, I'm not entirely convinced that uh, merchants are solely concerned uh, about sort of high payment processing costs, so much as wanting to reduce costs overall and spread the margins, and that this is really just an opportunity uh, to, to do that. Um, Let's switch it up. I'm going to turn now to the second issue, which looks at algorithmic underwriting as an enrollment strategy. So we have moved from this conversation here, which is about the relationship between the merchant and the consumer, and we're now pivoting towards this pair of relation, this relationship between the issuer and the prospective borrower, who uh, might uh, who is a prospective sort of credit card user. So in this area, I'm very interested in the ways in which algorithmic lending uh, links structural racism's historical precursors to present day technologies. Um, and the notion that do, this, this linkage may create new forms of racially problematic lending practices. Um, often institutional in form, uh, and function. Structural racism is a system of policies, practices, cultural representations, and other norms that work to initiate, perpetuate, or reinforce racial group inequities. Its intentional and implicit bias operate to animate and preserve features of socioeconomic stratification, disproportionately impacting uh, specific groups in our society such that uh, their diminished standing is misattributed to their race in isolation of more relevant discriminatory antecedents. So the arc of racism's legacy connects widely known historical wrongs to these demographic markers that shape contemporary access to credit. Things like your zip code, education, employment, earning power. Uh, so the highly sophisticated technologies now complement the traditional metrics while uh, capturing vast amounts of transactional data. Um, and they use this marriage 
in both the underwriting and marketing process. So that smartphones, mobile technologies, mobile internet access, location technology, census data continue to aid in these processes, which has transformed banking into these vast techno-capitalist institutions. I think structural racism is not helpful uh, as a theoretical framework for addressing these kinds of uh, problems. The rubric is mismatched with the harms occasioned by card industry practices, which marry these traditional and modern uh, uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of informational realities. And so I think we have to sort of look to that. So here's an interesting example. In 2010, the Wall Street Journal does this really interesting investigation where they look at Capital One. And they um, have, Capital One has this firm that they, they hire, which, here's how it works. You fire up your cell phone, you go to their website. The firm captures a whole bunch of information from your phone uh, or your mobile device. Uh, as its relay and the relay of information between the mobile device and the website. The firm then goes to the data bank, uh, this large behavioral data bank, and they build a composite of assumptions about your proclivities. And then they slot you in one of 66 Nielsen demographic ratings. Uh, and your placement in that taxonomy, right, determines the kind of card you get. So, I'm going to read some of the examples for those of you who haven't had a chance to read the paper. Segment 65 is labeled Big City Blues, and it reads as follows. With a population that's 50% Latino, Big City Blues has the highest concentration of Hispanic Americans in the nation. But it's also the multi-ethnic address for downscale Asian and African American households occupying the older inner city apartments in their cities. Concentrated in a handful of major metros, these young singles and single parent families face enormous challenges, low incomes, uncertain jobs, and modest education. More than 40% haven't finished high school. So that's a, 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 a descriptive that is used to then determine what interest rates you get on your car, what your credit limit is, right? Um, the seventh place, money and brains. You might want to know that. Residents of the money and brains uh, segment seem to have it all. High incomes, advanced degrees, and sophisticated tastes to match their credentials. Many of these city dwellers are predominantly white with a high concentration of Asian Americans and are married couples with few children who live in fashionable homes on small manicured lots. <laughs> How about that? So Audrey McFarlane makes the point that these descriptions use particular combinations of terms like upper class, affluent, diverse, or ethnic in ways that are not simply descriptive but infused with these value-laden assumptions. And at the very least, she says, these clusters may be skewed by images of ourselves that are sold to us and arguably, as a result, are coveted and absorbed. So, this is, this is really interesting to me. And just, just as an example, so I tested this theory uh, a while ago. I was in Newport Beach, California. I went to Capital One, applied for a credit card, and used all the same, I used a fixed you know, age, demographic, you know, all that stuff, income, all that sort of education, and whatnot. I get a card, and the rate is what it is. Then I go through the exact same process on a layover in Detroit. The exact same process. And I get a different card. Right? And from the same label, but I get a different <coughs> set of options in terms of my credit limits, the interest rates, the, the introductory rate is different. And so I think that is in keeping with what, you know, what I'm describing by way of an example. Now, the problem is that public law is very limited in its capacity to to, to reach this problem. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act forbids the use of certain demographic markers in determining creditworthiness, but this regime has no mandatory requirement for capturing race-based reporting in the way that residential mortgage mortgages have to uh, report out. So uh, we, we have a limit there. Then there's this sort of question about 
what we can do to fix this in other ways. How do we fix this? Um, there are counter-arguments about whether we should fix anything at all, and that there's this sort of paternalism here that we, uh, we need to be careful about, and that uh, people need to be free to make mistakes, and that there's this idea of just the exercise of all choice. Um, and so we've got these two problems, right? We've got the surcharge issue that we talked about over here. We have the uh, you know, we have the algorithmic lending issue that we have over here. I think the two of them converging on the marketplace uh, produce some very challenging questions. What do we do? What do we do about this? Um, so my siblings and I often have this talk. You know, as people of color, we think very carefully about how we position ourselves in the marketplace. I'll give you an example. When I first moved to the United States, I'm now, I don't know how old I am, I keep forgetting, but um, when I first moved to the United States, I was not yet 40. And um, I would not yet had a credit card in my entire life. Uh, being a child of immigrants, my mother always said, there's no need for that. If you, don't, if you can't afford something, you don't need it. So I never had one. Um, had no student loans, had savings, went to uh, move. I got a job, a law school teaching job, received a letter confirming my income from my dean, resume, all these things, started looking around for a place to live. And everywhere I went, people said, well, you have no credit rating. We're not prepared to accept your application. Right? So I think one of the tensions for folks who think that they should just walk away from credit cards and lending generally is that this exercise unlocks access to things, that the process of borrowing has been so deeply embedded in our uh, sort of in various segments of our society that it impacts access to housing, it impacts sometimes employment, and therefore it's not as simple as saying, well, let's just walk away from borrowing altogether. Um, and so I wonder whether we should just think about how to game the gamers. Maybe we think about how we borrow. Maybe we are strategic in the way that we, um, you know, the way that we structure our relationships to these credit instruments. On the other hand, maybe we should also be trying to take some of the juice out of the way we are so consumptive in our society. Do we, do we need to keep buying things and sort of? Status signal uh, our social so status signal uh, uh, in society by sort of constantly buying things and demonstrating that we are here as opposed to there in the socioeconomic hierarchy. <clears throat> so there are all kinds of difficult questions that are presented by this material, and so I'd like to open up. Given that I think we're running out of time, I'd like to open up perhaps and invite you folks to sort of join me in having a conversation about what we might do to fix this. If anyone has any questions, or questions in this room. Um, so this is really interesting, and I'm wondering, actually, if you could tell us more about what you think the path forward to fixing it is in terms of the surcharges and in terms of the algorithms. Because do you think we should ban them? I could also see an argument that actually the merchants need some surcharges because I know there are small businesses that really suffer because of how much it costs them to use credit cards. And I wonder if that has an adverse impact on minorities who are trying to, to build a business. So I'm just yeah. trying to get a better idea of whether you, you think we it. should ban everything or do something else. Uh, so, um, I'm still not sure because I think there's a. I, I think really there's an informational wall separating us from <coughs> what's really going on inside the structure of these of these surcharge these um, these these merchant uh, these uh, interchange fees. I don't think there's enough known about what the cost allocations are, what the cost breakdowns are, and therefore we can't have a more informed con conversation about how to respond. And my view of it is that I think that the card industry is quite happy with that. I think that their goal will always be to settle rather than litigate, because litigate, litigating puts all this out there 
uh, in the evidentiary record, such that we then start to see what's going on. So I think that's that's one part of the, the issue. How about the algorithms? The algorithms are 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 challenging. I think that that's where the real I think that's where the real opportunity to game the game really comes in, and I think we all need to think about so this is the tension I have. If I choose to give up my the now what two or three cars that I have um, because I I have this sort of social conscience about how I'm using these cars. Essentially, I, I'm now thinking in terms of competitive consumers because I don't want to give them up. And Juliet may have a similar card and she may choose to continue using her card and she'll get all these benefits that I'm not getting anymore because I've chosen to stop using my card. And even though we're both in the same card program, I may not be happy about that. So there's this self-interest that then I think is adding to the, the tension that I'm still wrestling with. Um, I think the other part of it is that if you're an affluent borrower, there's a new problem, which is you've been induced to take on this car because you think it's going to get you extra points so that you can go golfing in Jackson Hole or go down to the Sea Island Resort or wherever it is you, you vacation. And all of a sudden, you're in this new environment that I imagine is around the corner. You're running into all these places that won't take your card, and therefore you don't have an opportunity to accrue those points, right? So that there is sort of a, you know, a, a sort of a, a bait and switch or sort of a, miss, uh, a missed opportunity. So you then get frustrated in trying to sort of accumulate all those points. So nobody is happy, right? So I wonder, one of the things that occurs to me is by way of a solution. Maybe we shift to debit cards. Maybe we encourage more people to use debit cards and expand the reward programs that are on that side of the network. Does that change things? I don't know. Are we then simply migrating the same problem like a virus from one section of the card network uh, to another? I don't know. Um, I wonder if there's a, a sort of a light regulatory touch that we can look at. I'm still wrestling with that. Still wrestling with that. So my hands. Yep. Um, I have a suggestion for the surcharge problem. The surcharge problem, as I understand it, is the surcharges are in a fixed dollar or percent or monetary amount. So when I went to Logan Ferry and purchased something for less than ten dollars, they said I had to pay an extra twenty-five cents. Mm -hmm. That's very regressive, and it's the aggressiveness that you're objecting to. Well, what about a law that said the surcharge had to be based on a percentage of the purchase, so that the, the, it's a fixed surcharge, but it goes up the richer you are and the more you purchase. If I had purchased more books, then I'd have less. So I think I think an intermediate solution is to base the is to ban the surcharge based upon a regressive tax and move it to a progressive tax. And I think you've eliminated the problem. In my view, though, I think that the you know the challenge with that is that the actual cost, the technical process of carrying out this inter interplay here is functionally indistinguishable. It doesn't matter what it is you're spending or how much you're spending, the actual exercise is probably the same. But we're allowed to, we're allowed to say we're going to distribute that cost to right. those who get the benefit and the rich who get more benefit. So I don't see anything wrong with changing the nature of the surcharge in order to eliminate its regressiveness. It, it's not, in, for me, the value system is not inconsistent to say rich ought to pay a bigger percentage of the cost of running the system than the poor. <coughs> uh, 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 a bigger dollar amount, I'm sorry, same percentage or a bigger dollar amount. And but in essence, it's not the rich folks who are paying it, it would be the merchants who are catering to the rich folks who are paying it. Right? They're collecting, they're collecting, they're, yeah, they're collecting right. from the customer. They, they might be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? So one thing that seems to tie these two problems that you're describing together is that they both feature some pretty significant information asymmetries. You talked a little bit about how transparency might work in the surcharge context. I wonder if you have thoughts about what transparency might look like in terms of the algorithmic context, right? This idea of sort of accountable mm -hmm. algorithms, I think, is something that's gaining some right. yeah. some purchase. How do you think that might play out in, in terms of the problem that you're describing here? 
Well, um, I think part of the interesting feature about it, uh, that is that when you, you know, when you go online, so often, quite often, what you're doing is you're you're consenting to all this information sharing. You know, you, do you agree to this? Do you agree to that? Uh, and no one ever tells you what's going on in the aggregate. Um, and I wonder whether uh, one way to handle that is sort of a mandated disclosure process or a mandated disclosure regime. I think we'd have to think about how we design that. I mean, what is it that we're asking for in that process? Are we looking, is that, I think that connects to this public law question about how we report out. And I, I Dale Lance and I spoke about this when we were talking about an earlier draft of this paper. And I remember one of the things that he and I were chatting about was how you find a way to disentangle the sort of the moral hazard, I think Julia, you, you described it that when you were looking at a prior iteration of the paper, from the legitimate business process. And it may be that this disclosure regime on the actuarial side of things, on the algorithmic side, could be devised in such a way as to demonstrate the ways in which these entities are trying to dis effectuate that disentangle. So I mean, I think that that might be one one approach. I'm still wrestling with exactly what that looks like. Are you are you going to share your methodology, bearing in mind that you're talking about a space that's highly competitive, and that it, when I talk about it with other colleagues in sort of the fintech space, they all sort of groan and back up and say, "Well, wait a minute, that's almost like a trade secret, right?" And I think that's what that's what I keep colliding with. Is that it, it, it has a, a kind of proprietary sort of protectiveness about it that, that you, you, and you can see how these financial uh, firms are not interested in having that conversation. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Yes? So I don't know anything much about the First Amendment, um, so I think this is probably a very dumb question, but I'm really surprised that there's a colorable First Amendment argument against the state laws that are attempting to regulate the uh, the discounts and, and surcharges. If that's true, isn't there a colorable First Amendment argument that the antitrust laws, which prohibit horizontal price exchange of price information between horizontal competitors, violate the First Amendment? Or am I missing something? <laughs> 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 I 